Hi, I'm Jenny Rosencrantz with the University of Maryland Extension. July can be a really steamy, hot, and muggy month. So let's go into a nice, cool, shady garden and take a look at what we have growing that thrives in the shade. I'm gonna start off right here with this beautiful hanging basket of beautiful shade-loving plants. We have caladiums with lots of different colors of foliage. We have beautiful begonias with lots of beautiful color here. And then this neat little creeping jenny that just sort of cascades over. We have a lot more other things to look at, so join me in Delmarva Gardens coming up next right here on Pack 14. The neat thing about having a shady area is you can go ahead and fill it with so many beautiful containers of tropical plants that need to come in or just let go quietly in the wintertime. But some of the textures and colors are so available and they actually thrive in a shady location. So here we have these huge leafed taros. These are like sometimes called elephant ears because they're so big. This one's kind of tiny, whereas this guy right here was just absolutely huge. And they come in lots of different shades, like this one right here is green with black, which is very, very pretty. And uh, then they even, for the people who like it a little bit darker, they have this gorgeous black one, which is almost, well, it's probably a deep, deep purple, but it looks totally black. The other thing that's really cool in a shade garden is you can do an awful lot like with begonias. So she's got some begonias here that have pinks and purples, greens and silvers, and this has got a lot of just green. Notice how some of them have been torn apart. Now that could have been because we've had a lot of rain, but also snails and slugs can be a problem with a lot of these things. This is a beautiful little begonia with bright colors. And the other thing that she's paired them with is these brightly colored caladiums, which do have flowers, but you grow them for the foliage. And then here's one that's just emerging and it's gonna be polka dotted, which is kind of cool. And then she also has these uh, sweet potato vines Here's the marguerite, which is a bright, bright green, and then the one that has a little bit of pink. So she's pulling all the colors of pinks and greens and silvers all together. And then on the other side, she just has two really cool begonias with lots of the right colors, dark green with lots of pinks here. This is called a dragon wing begonia, and it can get to be two to three feet tall, depending on how much soil it has. And in a pot like this, it's going to be kept at the size that she probably wants simply because the pot is constricting the root growth. And that's another consideration. The more root space your plant has, the taller, the wider, the larger it can get. But if you want it to be a little bit smaller, you can go ahead and plant it in a really pretty decorative container and say, I want you to stay that size. So she's got this beautiful angel wing type of begonia right here with a, a lot of uh, burgundies on the underside, green and silver. And then the, the dragon wing, which has just the plain green, but all this gorgeous flowers. And it just makes a really nice statement. Well, let's take a look at what other wonderful things are actually thriving in the shade in this hot July weather. Some shade-loving plants are perennials. And perennial plants usually have a time where they bloom. Like for instance, this is a beautiful little plant right here that has already finished blooming. This is an astilbe. And so it bloomed earlier this year. And even though it's not blooming, you still have this beautiful fern leaf foliage, which is so lovely. And this is a gorgeous uh, bleeding heart. This is the Japanese, excuse me, the Chinese bleeding heart. And it was gorgeous. It had arching branches with these beautiful flowers that look like little hearts with a little drop of blood on them. And this is just, as you can see now, it's just beginning to go dormant. That's the neat thing about this type of herbaceous perennial. It goes dormant in July, so it's about ready to fall apart right now. But hiding it is this beautiful hydrangea and this absolutely gorgeous caladium. Look at the colors on that. So this is what people are going to start looking at instead of the, uh, the bleeding heart. And beside them, we have a little bit of epimedium, which is finished blooming. That blooms really early in the springtime. And then this is a Lenten rose, dark, dark green foliage. This is evergreen all year long. And uh, you can still see where some of the flowers had been. So even though they're not in bloom, they're still adding so much color and texture. And right over here is a hydrangea that just loves this shade. Now this shade here is not like the shade at my house. I've always often told you how the shade at my place is shady, but I have dry shade. This has got a lot of uh, really good loam and humus in it too. And I think it has a little bit more clay than mine does. And so like this hydrangea is just loving it. Now this is a lace cap. 
you have all these beautiful large flowers here. These are all infertile, but boy, they tell the uh, pollinators, here is where the flowers are. So it says, come over here, and then all these right here in the center, the blue and the lavender, um, those are all the fertile ones, and that's where the pollinators will go to say, hmm, there's a smorgasbord going on. Don't you love summer picnics? <laughs> Let's take a look at some other really cool plants. One thing I love about gardening is that there are so many plants that you can actually dig up and share with your friends. And that kind of keeps gardens going. Uh, sometimes it, it, uh, it's just cool to have a new plant. And sometimes the plant has something that's got like maybe some emotional uh, something with it too. So that's neat. Like for instance, this beautiful lush fern right here that absolutely loves this shade and all the moist soil that is here. It's just thriving this year. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And this is one that was given to my friend here by another friend of hers. And so in the fall, what they did is they dug it up and they shared it and she got some, another friend got some, another friend got some. Mine didn't make it because it's just so dry. I have to find the right place that keeps moisture and I have limited, you know, because I have so much sandy soil. The other thing that I cannot grow that she can grow is this gorgeous, gorgeous forget-me-not. Now most forget-me-nots are tiny. Um, you can tell that, that they're forget-me-nots by this, the heart-shaped leaf right here, but also notice how the lobes kind of cross over like that. So that's usually an indication that this is a forget-me-not. Um, this is a giant variety, but I love the silver foliage. And when it blooms, it blooms early in the springtime, a little stem comes up and it sort of nods over and it's covered with these bright blue forget-me-not flowers. Just gorgeous. I'm just so jealous she has that. The other thing that she can grow, and I can grow, thank goodness, is these beautiful plants right here. These are coral bells. Now most coral bells are a nice dark green, but sometimes you get some that are kind of bright. So this is one that's uh, almost a chartreuse in color, and it's got a little bit of pink in color also. And she likes pink in her garden, so she picks plants that have contrasting colors, but also some that will pull in that pink shade. And this one definitely does. Now the coral bells, are the little flowers there, instead of being coral flowers, with this variety, the flowers are sort of a white, but notice how the stem is a dark, dark pink. So again, she's keeping the color theme, just moving through the garden. The nice thing about these coral bells is unlike the, uh, the forget-me-nots and the ferns and the caladiums, they actually stay evergreen throughout the winter time. And that's really an important part of having a garden. Let me show you some of the other parts of the garden that keep that, what they call bones of the gardens alive by having beautiful dark green foliage all through the winter. Well, these are beautiful rhododendrons and they're nice and big and lush. And these are what they call the bones of the gardens because they're gorgeous all through all four seasons. In the winter, they're still evergreen. In the springtime, they'll have gorgeous flowers. In the summertime, they're evergreen. And in the fall, they're still evergreen. So it's really nice. They do drop some of their foliage um, in the early springtime, but that's still an okay thing. Um, when they bloom, quite often they'll have uh, a lot of new foliage with it too, but you can still see where the flowers used to be. Now, a lot of people say to me, my rhododendrons bloom really well every other year. And I say, well, rhododendrons, because they put so much energy into making seeds, the best thing to do is after they finish blooming, is just go down here and just see how you can see here's the foliage right here and here's where the flower was. Just bend it off right like that and just remove that. So here's one, here's another one. Let's see if I can do that real easy. There we go. And one last one. Even if you're vertically challenged, you can grab these guys and go ahead and get rid of the flowers. There we go. And see, you still have the new foliage right there. And that foliage will go ahead and just make the plant look nice and full, which is really good. So this is one of the nice things because it's big. It gives you a lot of background. Now, up front, there's a little bit more um, color. This is an azalea. When these bloom, the entire plant is in full color. And, uh, but this is going to stay very, very low to the ground. It's one of the things that she's gone ahead and done, too, is after they bloom, you can go ahead and bring them down really, really hard. And I'll show you that, too. But I want to share one other plant that's really good as the bones of the garden, and that is uh, Pieris. So Pieris have really pretty fl flowers and they're kind of in a whirl shape. And when they bloom, the flowers are like a cascade, so it looks like a beautiful waterfall when it's all in bloom. Sometimes the flowers are pink, sometimes the flowers are white. Uh, and sometimes you get a variety, like this one, 
that when it starts to have new foliage, the foliage is a pinkish red. And that's really pretty too. So it gives you a little bit different color as it starts to come out in leaf. So let me show you how she's gone ahead and done some trimming too. But before that, I want to show you a couple other plants. You know, some plants that are absolutely gorgeous in a container in the nursery and you say, oh, I've got to have that in the garden. It really likes the area, but then it gets a little bit too aggressive. And that is the case right here of the, the actually it's called Bishop's Gout Weed. So it sounds like it's kind of interesting, although do bishops get gout and what does the plant have to do with that? I never understood that. But this is a plant that was planted in this garden, escaped the fence. Plants don't look at fences and escape as a barrier and flowed down into the wooded area. So the Bishop's Gout Weed, Bishop's Gout Weed is all over the place. It is a pretty plant when you take a look at it close up. It has really pretty variegated foliage. It does have little flowers, but it just can, as you see, take over the world. So sometimes when you're looking at getting a plant that's really good in the sun or the shade, look into the growth of the plant, look into see what really needs to be done to it. And is it really aggressive? Oh, hello, cat. Cats love gardens, by the way. Always share the garden with your cat. And you're the reason why I've got something going on too. This is a young cat and he's just learning how to hunt. And one of the problems that my friends had here is a lot of the plants that she's planted, the voles have eaten. And she's gone to some pretty serious ways of trying to take care of it. But I've got a solution that I think might help. And this little guy right here is also gonna be a help too. Once you learn how to hunt the voles. Well, gardens are always evolving also. And because of the vole problem that my friend just had, this garden has evolved in many, many different ways. We were laughing about the fact that she knows she has certain plants that she started out with, but she doesn't even think that they're there anymore. And so we were sort of looking through them and nope, they're gone. The voles have eaten them up. We were talking about also what she used to plant here. And she used to love impatience. And you can see a little seedling of impatience right here. And this is just basically a volunteer. It's got the same pink color that she absolutely loved. The reason why she doesn't grow them anymore is that they got a, a type of disease called downy mildew. And you would notice the downy mildew on the underside of the foliage. Now this one doesn't have any right now, so that's pretty good. But what will happen is it will have this yellow, uh, this white powder stuff on the bottom of the leaf, which will quickly devour the leaf. It's, it's a disease. It will quickly devour the leaf. The leaf will fall off. And all you're stuck with at that point is just like stems with a few little flowers looking very, very pitiful. And then the whole plant collapses. So we've had to deal with downy mildew on, vinc uh, on the impatiens for, I think this is like the fourth or fifth summer. And we still don't have a real good handle on how to take care of it. You can put fungicides on it, but that's not foolproof. And we've had a lot of rain. So I'm really impressed that this is still here, but this is a brand new seedling. So we'll see how it does. So what she has here is some azaleas that are very low to the ground, and she's planted coleus. Now coleus, again, is one of those wonderful plants that absolutely adores the shade, and this one um, has got a lot of the different colors in it. Uh, the leaves are a little bit tattered. We had a pretty strong rainstorm just a little while ago. So I think some of this damage here is not due to, vol uh, to slugs and snails, but slugs and snails can tear this up. But I think that this is more due to the sheer amount of water that came down. Now this part right here is where the flower is going to be, and I'm actually going to pinch that off because this time of year, what you want with these guys is to have lots and lots of foliage because you bought it for the foliage and not for the flowers. And by pinching it off, it goes, oh, I've got to make more leaves for the flowers. So it sort of delays the flowering a little bit more. Um, she does have a New Guinea impatient. That's the white one right over there. They are not susceptible to the downy mildew, uh, but they need a little bit more sunshine. And uh, so that's why that's growing in that little pocket of sunshine there. So what she had here was a type of uh, plant called saxifrage. And the voles ate quite a lot of the roots. And this is all that's left. So she put it back in a pot and said she's trying to go ahead and grow it in the pot. Now, anytime you grow a plant in the pot like this, you have to continue to water it as if it was in the nursery because it, it basically is self-contained. So you might have a rainstorm that everything is fine, but if this one does not get watered or doesn't get the adequate amount of water, the water will only go down maybe this far, and you really want the water to go all the way down through the pot. So 
by having plants in pots. That means that you have got to get out here with a watering can on occasion and water it. And you just need to take a look at it every day to see does it need water or doesn't it need water. Well, like I said, my friend had some beautiful hostas here and a lot of them were eaten. And her friend is Paul. So this is a beautiful hosta called Paul's Glory. And I, this is just such a cool hosta because it starts out the leaves are just sort of a, a medium green with a darker green edge. But as they mature, the green fades to a white. So you have this multicolor of green and chartreuse green and chartreuse, and then green and almost a creamy white, which is really pretty. And this is in bloom right now, so you still have the foliage coming up to where the, the uh, flowers are. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take it out of the pot, and I'm going to plant it. But I'm also gonna go ahead and use um, this wire. This is called, hard, sometimes people call it hardware cloth or wire. And I'm gonna go ahead and cut an area and line the, um, the outside of where the plant is gonna grow with the wire to prevent the voles from coming after it. So we have a bet going. She goes, will that work? And I said, between the wire and the cat, we might handle the voles. So I'm gonna to get to work. Okay, I've got the hole dug. And one thing I noticed as I was digging is that there's a lot of worms, earthworms here. Earthworms are the best gardeners and they work for free. They don't have union rules or anything like that. Uh, they take the nutrients up and down to the soil profile. They're fabulous. And if you have earthworms, that meant you know that you've got good garden soil. So I'm just gonna go ahead and see if this is deep enough or if it's too deep. Okay, so you can see where the soil line is right here and the soil line of this is, is just exactly right. Sometimes I amaze myself. Okay, good. Now notice how the hole was much wider than the plant in the pot. And that's because I want to be able to go ahead and have room for those roots to grow out. And I also want to go ahead and line this hole with the hardware cloth. So that's what I'm going to do next is go ahead and cut that to the right shape. Okay, this has got to be unrolled. When you get it in a roll, it's very, very tightly wrapped. So you have to kind of bend it so you can go ahead and work it to what you want it to do. And this is going to be wide enough. I'm going to go ahead and cut half of it because it's not really wide enough. But I have, let's see. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm just cutting this piece because I want to make sure that the, um, that the sides of the plant are protected. And every time you cut something like this with this metal, you don't want to have the metal um, edges pointing upward because that will really hurt somebody. Notice how sharp those are. And, uh, but on the other side, if I flip it over, it's very soft. So this is the side that's gonna go up. So I'm gonna put this in the ground like this. And I'm gonna put this in the ground again, the right side in. Let's see, let me do it. It's always going to be a challenge to do something like this. There we go. And this way I can go ahead and have some of this up like that. All right. And this in like that. Okay, that'll work. Making sure it's in there okay. Pull it out a little bit. Yeah, you have to play with these. But all the cut edges are going to be in the ground, which is the important thing. Okay, so I like to put on gardening gloves sometimes. I love getting my hands dirty, but it's a lot easier to clean under your nails if you're wearing gloves. So what I'm going to do now is take the plant out of the pot. And anytime you're, you're planting a pot, plant that's in a pot, you need to go ahead and score the bottom. You can take a look at the roots. These are good roots right here. There we go. Ah, look at those roots. That's a happy plant. So I'm gonna just go ahead and tease some of this open a little bit. Because these roots are, are used to growing down and then they hit the bottom of the pot and then they turn 
and just grow in the same direction. And if I just left it go like that, they would never grow out of that area. They would always continue to grow in a circle and they would actually girdle themselves. I have seen it done to trees and that's very dangerous for the tree because it doesn't give the tree stability. With a, uh, with a herbaceous perennial, you just want to make sure that it has a chance to go ahead and explore soil areas that have more nutrition. So, okay, good. This end there. Good enough. Okay, and now I'm just going to go ahead and backfill. Get all of those little earthworms in there. The other thing you want to be sure of is never put the soil over top of where the roots are. Um, if you bury a plant too deeply in the soil, the roots will actually not have enough oxygen and they will not be happy. There we go. Okay, good. Now I'm just going to go ahead and water it in real quick. And you want to water it all the way around to make sure that the, the plant is evenly set into the soil. All the air pockets are out. And you're actually encouraging it to grow into the new soil. Now the thing to do, of course, would be to go ahead and add a little bit of mulch on this. And that will keep the, uh, the soil from bouncing onto the plant every time it rains. There we go. So we don't have any mulch today, but we can get mulch later on. So that should be a way to take care of the voles. We'll let you know about that. There's a, a couple of other really cool plants that I do want to share with you a little further over here is a type of uh, fern. And this is a really delicate maidenhair fern. And I like it because it's, it's not evergreen in the wintertime, but it's just so light and delicate. And again, this is something I cannot grow, but it just loves the moist soil, all the humidity that all of these plants give, as well as the shade that's here. And you can see that there's some dappled sunlight here, so it likes that too. It's just a lovely, delicate little plant. I do, do, just love it. Oh, I also want to share with you some of the cool things that uh, my friend has done in her garden. You know, sometimes garden implements and garden decorative items uh, have to be repurposed. This was a beautiful bird bath at one time, but then it developed leaks, so it didn't really hold water. And that's kind of important to have water if you want it to be a bird bath. But on the other hand, it makes a really cool planter. So my friend's gone ahead and planted uh, a couple of different types of ferns. This is one of the maidenhair ferns right here, the nice light and delicate one right here. And this guy right here that's sort of cascading down is called a rabbit foot fern. Now this one is actually tropical, so she'll have to bring, either bring this in or, or keep one inside. It's called a rabbit foot fern, a hare foot fern, because the fronds right here have a real soft, fuzzy, look like a little foot. And uh, they're delicate and all that, so that's neat. And she's gone ahead and put a container there, lined it with uh, river jacks, which are these nice little round stones, and that way she has a little bit of water there for the birds. So it's become a bird bath again. And notice how she's got moss all the way around it too. So this makes a really nice decorative garden ornament again, just repurposed. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the tour of this little shady garden that has all the wonderful soil moisture that I, my gardens don't have. And I hope you've enjoyed Delmarva Gardens right here on Pack 14. Mm -hmm.